Who are you? Oh, I'm introducing myself. Yes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> this reminds me of going to like when you go to a conference with a bunch of people that you work with and they say, oh, everybody take a turn and introduce yourself. I never know what to say. Um. <laughs> I guess I would answer that I'm a middle-aged American that relocated to Germany and never in my life did I say it this way. I came to Germany five years ago. That was unexpected. I live in Stuttgart. That was unexpected. I live in a small town outside of Stuttgart. That's unexpected. I'm going to have my pilot's license by the end of about 90 days from now. That's unexpected. And I'm performing very well at the job that I have. And that was unexpected. Okay, so I just would describe myself as unexpected. It's a life full of unexpected things. <laughs> life never goes in the direction you think it's going to. I promise you that. Well, for you it certainly didn't. No, it did not. <laughs> I mean, you did have some interactions with the law. Some problems with the law. Let's call them adventures. Adventures. <laughs> That's a, that's good as well. <laughs> now, how come? What what was the thing where you first came into touch with the law? The first time I came in contact with the law, or the yes. first time I got in trouble. Both. Oh. See, the problem with answering questions that are so focused, like the one you're asking, is in real life there are no simple answers. They are always complicated. I'll start with one answer and if it doesn't, if we have to go back and fill in the background, then we will. The first time I had contact with law enforcement negatively, meaning something other than a traffic ticket, because I've had plenty of those would have been 1994 when I was 22 years old. I was a university student at a university in the neighborhood of Miami, in the United States, obviously. I don't think there is another Miami, but in, the, in Florida. We'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> and while I was a university, while in university I was studying for psychology at the time, I was studying for my degree. And I had to participate in a practicum And that practicum took place in a lockdown facility for juvenile male sex offenders. What that meant was we had juveniles, meaning under the age of 18, who had committed some sort of sexual offense defined by American law, which is a key point in this story, in which uh, they were put into this treatment program, which was involuntary. They had no choice. They were court-ordered to be there. They didn't want to be there. And they were juveniles, so they were under the age of 18. Correct. They were, I think, ranging from 12 to 18, or 12 to 17. And one of the juveniles in particular, I guess it doesn't matter if we use his name now because he's gone public with it. So his name is, Ro was his name is Robert. His name is Robert. And he was already a twice convicted sex offender by the time he was 15, meaning he was the perpetrator at least two times that I know of before I met him. He was one of the residents of this treatment facility, and he wanted out. He wanted to go to a different program that he felt was less restrictive. So he accused me and several nurses at the this facility of sexual inappropriate behavior. So I cannot speak to what happened to the, I think it was three nurses, but don't quote me on that. I don't know what happened to them because I never had contact with those nurses again, but I was arrested in November of 1994 and incarcerated. That was the last time I saw the free world for the next 22 years. Okay, uh, Robert accused me of taking photographs of him naked in one of the conference rooms. 
He accused me of performing oral sex on him in an open day room with like 20 other people present and video cameras and accused me of standing outside of his bedroom window at this secure facility and watching him take a shower and masturbate. All right. Those were the specific accusations. Now, under Florida law, this is very different than European law. Under Florida law, anyone under the age of 18 cannot engage in sexual acts at all. Period. With yourself, with another person, with another teenager, no. The answer is no. Which is very different than European law, specifically German law, which says 14 and older, they can make a decision themselves, assuming that the parents consent and blah, 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 blah. You know, there are, there are parameters, as there should be. So after I came to Germany, my case was actually reviewed by, as you know, by both the Bundeskriminalamt and the Verfassungsgericht. And in both cases, they said that the crimes that I had committed in the United States in Europe would not have counted as crimes. Okay. All right. Now, you've been in prison for how long for that, for these accusations? Uh, okay, let's go there. I know I'm sort of inserting my own opinion when I say this. This, this is definitely my own opinion. But it's based on decades of research. The United States criminal justice system is geared toward conviction. It is not geared toward fact-finding. That's not what it's about. Based on laws that we can talk about if you want, the way that the rules of court are set up, if you are accused of a sex offense, any sex offense in the United States, you basically have no defense. There's, there's basically nothing you can say. I'll give you some examples. There is a law in the state of Florida that says that lack of knowledge of the victim's age is not a defense. What that means is if you're in a bar and you meet a girl and she's holding an ID card that says that she's a university student, that she's 21 years old, let's say she shows you a driver's license and both of them are fake. You ask her, how old are you? And she says, I'm 21. And you're in a bar. She was carted at the front door coming in and you guys share drinks. And later she says, hey, let's go outside and sit in a car and, you know, make out or whatever. So you go with her. You've done your due diligence. You have asked, can I see proof of your age? If it is later determined that her identification was false, you can't use that as a defense in court. You're guilty. You're going to jail. That's it. Uh, that's one. Um, Another one, this is, the, to me, this is absolutely absurd and absolutely could not happen in Germany. Under Florida law, where I was arrested, and I'm quoting, the victim's testimony need not be corroborated in prosecutions under the sexual battery statute. What that means is the victim can make an accusation against you with no proof whatsoever. And under Florida law, that is enough to convict you. If the victim tells a good enough story and goes into court and, and says it in front of the jury, what can you do? Nothing. It's your word against theirs, and the law presumes that the victim is telling the truth. That's part of the problem in my case. I think it was 13 years later, after I was convicted for this crime, the victim came forward and admitted that damn near everything he said was a lie. Doesn't matter. The law presumes that he was telling the truth at the time. And that's it. And I have to live with the conviction, even though he came back and said it was a lie. I have to live with that conviction for the rest of my life. I don't think there's anything fair about that. So having said all that, once, once I was arrested, there was no way to defend myself. And I also want to be crystal clear for you and anybody else who's watching this video. I'm not pretending that I'm 100% innocent. I'm not going to sit in this chair and tell you that I didn't do some of the things he accused me of. Because the truth is, I did. I have no reason to lie about it now. I've already done the, the prison time. I've already served. I've, I've, I've finished with everything. So I, I, I can sit here and deny everything. But that would be, well, be a lie. Did I try to take pictures of him? Yes. Now that's a whole different story because then I have to explain how I got into the situation where I was taking pictures. But it doesn't matter. I did that. I did that. Everything else he said was a calculated lie on his part because he knew 
he knew everything I, I'm just telling you. He'd already been through the process twice. He knew how to manipulate the system far better than I did. I was naive as, as, ooh, as, 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 as could possibly be. So he knew how to take that one little grain of sand and build an entire mountain out of it. And that's what he did. Now, did he feel guilty about it later? Did he come back and try to fix it? Yes, he did. I'll give him that credit. But it doesn't change the fact that he ruined my life. Now, having said that, another thing I want to be crystal clear about. As much as I want to say the victim lied, as much as I want to say the justice system is in the United States is rigged toward conviction, the truth of the matter is I put myself in a vulnerable position. That means that at the end of the day, I'm responsible for my actions. Even the, the, the things that I did do with him, I'm responsible for that. And I am a firm believer that when the law is transgressed, you, ha you have to be held accountable for it. Now, I do think the punishment needs to match the crime. But if you break the law, you have to be held accountable. Okay, that's fine. I'm okay with that. I just think the American justice system takes it a little too far. Um, but that's probably a different topic. Let's get back to the point where I asked you how long you were in prison for. Uh, I don't think that was the way you worded the question, but let's take it, take it that way. Uh, for this, for my convictions related specifically to these accusations. Right. He was 15. I was 22. Let's throw in the fact that we're talking 1994, so the fact that it was a homosexual element played heavily into it. For that, I was sentenced to eight years in prison, followed by a mandatory 15 years of supervision. All right. And um, what exactly happened after? I mean, we're assuming you did your eight years? No, I did not. You did not? Under Florida law at the time, you get a certain amount of time off your sentence if you go to prison and behave, if you don't cause any problems. Good behavior. We've got the as well. Something like that, no yeah. It's, it's a farce, but, but basically. Now, they've since changed that, but that's the way it was then. So on the eight years, I think I served just shy of five years. So five on eight. And in my last year of prison, this would have been 1999, the state of Florida passed a new law that they called the Jimmy Rice Act. This was a law that allowed prosecutors to keep sex offenders in prison beyond the end of their prison sentences indefinitely if state psychologists determined that this person was likely to commit new sex offenses in the future. So under no circumstance did I think I was going to qualify under that law. The accusations that Roberts made against me were all by definition nonviolent. Absolutely. He, he said everything was consensual. There was nothing uh, no violence, no force, no threats of force, nothing like that. So I absolutely did not believe that I would be held under that law. And they waited until literally the day of my day before my release. This was in September 1999. Um, they literally woke me up one morning in my dormitory, told me to go up to the front gatehouse. They put me in handcuffs, shackles, and waist chains, put me in a van with no warning whatsoever and transported me to a private prison in the middle of a swamp, sort of in central Florida. Well, they don't call it prison, do they? They call it the Martin County Treatment Facility? The Martin Treatment Center. Treatment Center. Here's the farce. The Martin Treatment Center literally sits on the same property as the Martin Correctional Institution, which is a maximum security prison facility. It was originally built as the Martin County Jail. But in order to turn it into a treatment center for sex offenders, now again, we keep using this word treatment. People are there to be treated for their, I don't know, mental disorders. But in order to prepare it to be appropriate, uh, you know, uh, maybe appropriate is not the right word, to, to make it, I, I'm, I'm literally lacking the word. In order to make it adequate for sex offenders, to make it appropriate for their treatment, they added double rows of barbed wire fence and electrified those fences and had two gun trucks with armed correctional officers surrounding the building at all times, circling at all times. We lived in concrete bunkers with iron beds and very thin mattresses. We had to sit up for count time every three hours or so. 
the outside of the building was patrolled by prison guards. Prison guards operated the chow hall. The prison doctor came over and gave us our medical treatment once a day or however it was. I don't quite remember. And all of the staff that worked inside the building also worked at the prison. So when they were done working at the prison, they would literally change out of their uniforms into civilian clothes and come into our building and work. It was a farce. The, the, the thing was an absolute farce. And so, yeah, Martin Treatment Center. Yeah, that's where I was. Martin Treatment Center. Now, you haven't been there too long. <laughs> okay. I think the way they worded it was that there came a time when I no longer participated in treatment. <laughs> Euphemism is I broke the hell out of there. Um, yeah, there are several versions to this story. <laughs> Now, the official version starts with you climbing a fence in there. Oh, it starts before that. They said that... It's irrelevant what they said. It, it, the story starts before that. But if we're talking about how the escape happened... Damn, I can't remember what day it was. June 5th? Might have been June 5th, 2000. It's been so long that I don't even remember. June 5th, 2000, in the afternoon, right after lunch, um, we were allowed to go outside into our recreation area. Again, this was a heavily barbed wire area that was not much bigger than a basketball court. And we were allowed to go out there and basically get fresh air. So at exactly one o'clock in the afternoon, in the distance, you could hear the helicopter. And when I heard the helicopter, that was my cue to go to one of the inside fences and climb from the, where the recreation yard was. Okay, let me back up a second. You have the double perimeter fences all the way around the facility. And then inside of that was the recreation yard. Right. So by climbing the fence and going through that barbed wire and jumping over it, it put me in a larger area that was still within the prison. But it made it very difficult for anybody to try to stop me from going to the helicopter. Um, the prison guards couldn't get to me. Inmates who maybe wanted to try, try to play hero couldn't stop me. Anybody that wanted to go along with me couldn't go. So, oh, I would say within 30 seconds of me climbing that fence and landing on the other side, uh, my partner in crime, Clifford. Clifford Burkhart. Clifford Burkhart. Flew over the double perimeter outside fences, turned the chopper slightly, and landed a helicopter on the recreation yard. Well, I say landed. He didn't quite completely land. Um, he was maybe, maybe 50 centimeters off the ground when I tried to board the aircraft. That unbalanced the aircraft, and depending on which version of events you believe, and I'm not sure what the truth is, I was there, and I'm not sure. Um, I think one of the rotor blades, or maybe both of them, hit the mud when we were unbalanced. And then he steadied, steadied the aircraft. We finally got back up into the air. And as we came over the double fences as we were leaving, there were two gun trucks that had come and stopped on either, you know, facing each other. And the guards came out with shotguns. And as we were flying over them and they started to point a shotgun, I showed them the barrel of one of my weapons that had been sitting on my seat when I boarded the aircraft, and that was enough for them to back down. I had better firepower than they did. That fight was only going to go one way. And I sure as, sure as hell didn't want it to go that way. Uh, that would only have compli complicated my situation. But when people ask, why did you have guns if you weren't intending to hurt somebody, they were for our protection. It was to keep us from getting hurt, not to hurt other people. And I'll come back to this point in just a moment. All right. So we... Let's just say that in the official version, you did hit the ground. Okay. So that was an original version, or the official one, mm -hmm. uh, from the OPPAGA. Mm -hmm. And um, they tell us the story that you landed in the in an orange field. I was going there. A few hundred yards away. Mm, yeah, I don't agree with the few hundred yards. I think it was further than that. But that's irrelevant. The distance is irrelevant. Once we were clear to the fences and we flew over a canal in a berm, we were flying over an orange grove, as you said. And somewhere along the way, there were, up ahead of us, there was a row of pine trees that we were flying towards. 
And I remember thinking to myself that we're not high enough to clear those trees. We better start gaining altitude. And trees are getting closer, closer, closer. We're not gaining altitude. And I was about to say something to Cliff. I mean, obviously, he can see in front, too, and he's the pilot. Um, but I was about to say something when a orange light started flashing on our dashboard, very, very loudly buzzing, and then he says, oh, shit. And literally, that's the last thing I remember from being in the sky. Um, we came down out of the air, landed directly on a palm tree. The tail of the aircraft, if you've seen the photographs, the tail of the aircraft broke free and, and flew away, spun away, whatever. And because I wasn't wearing a safety harness, I was thrown through the windshield and landed in the dirt. Which is one of the more interesting moments of my life because I didn't know what had happened. I only remember looking up and seeing sky. That's all I could see was blue sky and white clouds. And I literally remember thinking to myself, so this is what it's like to be dead. And it's, it's really not that bad. Um, and I laid there for I don't even know how long. And then I heard behind me Cliff trying to climb out of the wreckage. He had had his safety harness on, so he had stayed in the wreckage. And I don't know, I sat up for a moment, checked myself for injuries. I had a gash across my hand, and I was bleeding pretty decently, but that's it. That's, all, that's the only injury I had. So I ran back to where he was at, helped him out, and then he looked at me and he says, well, what do we do now? Well, we run. I mean, we're not just going to sit here and wait to get caught. So we grabbed the weapons that were on the ground and took off running. All right. Now, Clifford, you've been talking about him. Mm -hmm. It seems you have known him before, obviously. <laughs> Who exactly is Clifford Burkhardt? In answering the question, I have to be fair to him also. He's entitled to move on with his life, and he's entitled to. He's entitled to move on with his life. Cliff was my best friend from high school, and unquestionably the love of my life. Pretty short answer, but. The answer was it. Pretty good. Yeah, I'm still in love with him. 30, 40 years later, however long it is, I still think about him almost every day. It's a sad statement. <laughs> I just wanted to say that because I don't really think you do have contact or you're even allowed to. Oh, we're certainly allowed to have contact now. But um, the, actually, the last time we saw each other in prison, he told me, he said, you know, he was going to get out before me. Um, obviously, I'm sorry, let's back up a second. Because of this escape, my five-year prison sentence that, that I had served, I just got a whole bunch more time. And I received an additional 20 years in prison for the escape. 20 years? Mm -hmm. It was later amended to 18 years with two years supervision. Because I've noticed something different. I have 23 years because of five years gun. Um, oh the no, gun. they run together. Under Florida law, those two sentences run together. All right, okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, they're not added on, it's together. Okay, good. Okay, so I understood that wrong. Because I was thinking about you telling the government here in Germany 20 years, mm -hmm. and I looked at it and it said 18 years and five years. Yeah. And I think in Germany we just added on. Okay, no. Um, um, I was I was pretty confused because of the, I thought, well, how can the German court not check this? But oh, they definitely they, checked it. They definitely checked it, right. <laughs> yes, but I, I was just did. wondering how this difference can be. Yeah. Um, well, originally it was 20 years prison with five years probation. I later, this is, I guess, irrelevant to our conversation. But when I was serving those 10 years in isolation, I earned a minor law degree and I represented myself on appeal and I actually had the sentence overturned and reduced. So it later became 18 years. 18 years. Correct. And you served this whole 18 years. In, well, I, I don't, out of the 18, I don't know. I, I never sat down with a pen and paper and figured it out. I'll tell you that I served 22 years altogether from the day I was arrested in 1994 because of Robert and his accusations until the day I walked out in April of 2016. Okay. It's 22 years. A long 22 years. Let's get back to that escape one second. Okay. 
why? How or why did you make that decision? Mm. I'm gonna escape out of the prison, break a lot of your laws, just to get out. So I would I would I would phrase the question differently than, than that. I would say, I would ask not why were you willing to break a few laws? Why was I willing to risk my life? That's a better question. And then you have to ask, if I may be so bold as to, to suggest, why did Cliff risk his life to do that? A kid who'd never been in trouble before. Well, let's first start with the question why you did it. It's the same. Okay. It's the, the answer is the same for both of us. Given that the criminal justice system in the United States, particularly the state of Florida where I'm from, is geared toward conviction. It is not geared toward rehabilitation. There is no end in sight. There is no end to the punishment. So not only, there's just something fundamentally wrong. If I violate a law, I am given a sentence by the court to serve to make up for whatever terrible thing I did. At the end of it, it's supposed to be over. You told me I needed to serve eight years. Given the good time, I served my eight years. And then the government gets to come along and decide, no, we changed our minds. Now we can hold you indefinitely. Indefinitely means potentially forever. It means there is no end. Then why did you sentence me to eight years? Because I did my part. I served the part you told me to serve. And then you changed the rules on me? And then you say, I'm, we're going to take you in front of a new jury and tell the jury that you did all these horrible things and that you're a convicted sex offender. And we're going to let the jury decide whether or not you spend the rest of your life in a lockdown facility. What? There's nothing fair about that. There's nothing fair. Why should I have believed at that point, having been betrayed by the government, why was I supposed to believe that one day I was going to walk free? And keep in mind, at this time, Robert had not confessed yet. All I did was go to prison for what, what I truly did, for trying to take some pictures? And you're going to lock me away the rest of my life? Are you crazy? And you expect me to just sit here and live with that? Like it's okay? It's not okay. And I'm not going to sit here and wear it. So, but, and Cliff, of course, had walked every step of the way with me. He had been in court every time I was in court. For everything. He was always there. And he saw it. And if you ask, I, I really truly believe, if you ask the average person on the street, if someone commits a crime, should they be punished for it? Yes. When the punishment is finished, should it be over? Yes. That's just a fundamental, that's fundamental basic fairness. And so when the government can no longer be trusted because they just outright betrayed me, no. So you're saying you studied the law, right? Later. Later. Right? Later, I Later. did. While you were in 10 years in prison? No, while I was in 10 years in isolation. Right, isolation. Is there any other offense that is treated in the same way where they can just decide whether you're going to be in prison forever? No. There's not? There is not. In the United States, only sex offenders. Any, and when I say sex offender, let me clarify this. The way the American media works and the way the government and politicians have manipulated that media, they want you to believe that all sex offenses are the same or that all sex offenders are the same. So in other words, someone who is simply, let's say they're sitting in their car in a parking lot masturbating, not in front of anybody, but they're caught doing that. No victim. Nobody saw him but maybe a cop. They're trying to compare that to someone who brutally rapes a woman and slice, slices her throat and leaves her for dead. They want you to believe that all sex offenses are the same. And that's the, the problem is the United States, oh, this, is, this is such a political answer. The United States is so choked by the church that anything to do with sex, anything to do with nudity, is automatically seen as an extreme dirtiness. It's it's evil. It's horrible. We got to stamp it out. And they they just take everything automatically to the extreme, no matter how minor it is. And if you try to explain to the average person that not you know some sex offenses are just pretty stupid, the average person doesn't see it that way. 
and that's the result of politicians who were trying to get votes and they're always getting harder you know trying to get harder on sex offenses i'll give you another example every year florida passes more restrictive laws against those who commit sex offenses and right now there is a bill pending in the florida legislature to be voted on by the full assembly as to whether or not they're going to start enacting the death penalty against people who commit sex offenses. Now, again, I say sex offenses, you're automatically going to think the worst. You know, we're talking about multiple rapes. No, it's not always that. Sometimes it's just possessing pictures that you shouldn't. Not touching anybody, not threatening anybody, having no contact with anybody. Just possessing pictures on a computer desk is enough to send someone to prison for 25, 30 years in Florida. And the reason that really pisses me off is I know two people who murdered children. And I mean young children. Murdered them. And each one of them only got seven years in prison. All I was accused of doing was trying to take some pictures of somebody. And I got eight years followed by 15 paper. Then, potentially the rest of my life in a secure facility. No, I don't find that fair at all. I find that completely disproportionate. And there is no other crime in Florida that is treated that way. If we're going to talk about that, then let's go ahead and talk about the sex offender registry. There is no other crime in the United States in which a person who is convicted of that crime has to have their picture put on the internet with a description of their crime for the rest of their lives. Every six months, you have to go to a jail and give your fingerprints and, and give a new picture so that they can put it up in your neighborhood. And it, it, automatically, you cannot travel outside of your own home for more than 48 hours without telling a policeman that you're going to do it. Now, think about that. You could, if somebody commits a sex crime, 30, 40, 50 years later, they still have to ask permission to, to be away from their own home for more than 48 hours. That's absurd. At what point does the punishment end? And th that's the whole point of why I'm so angry and why I ended up getting involved in, in human rights law is because I don't have a problem. I, I agree with the fact that we have prisons and prosecutors and judges. I agree with that. Modern society has to be governed by rules and laws. It has to, to protect the innocent, to protect the guilty, to protect everybody. Everybody's rights need to be protected. I believe there has to be a balance in those rights. But the, the point is, if someone violates the law and they are held accountable and they are given a sentence, at the end of that sentence, it needs to be finished. Over. Right. That's my point.